Hi. So is there anybody left in the world who does not know about Brexit? Of course, a week and a half ago, British voters threw, overthrew the system and, and in a sense showed experts to be completely wrong when they voted against Britain staying in the EU. They voted to leave the EU. Brexit, of course, has had its implications over the last few weeks, but I'd like to talk a little bit about what I see in Brexit as an investor and perhaps lessons, broader lessons that I can use in investing. So a little bit of background. Britain joined the European Common Market in 1975 in a referendum. Yes, another referendum. In that referendum, the voters actually listened to the experts and voted yes with a two-thirds majority. That European Common Market, of course, became the EU, which then proceeded to adopt the euro as a currency in 92, though the UK decided to opt out of this in the Maastricht Treaty in 92 and stayed with the British pound. In 2014, David Cameron, then Prime Minister of Britain, announced that he would again put in front of the voters a referendum on whether Britain should stay as part of the EU. He did this as part of political calculations because he felt that by offering this option, he could keep Eurosceptics, or a big part of the, the Conservative Party, on board in the next election. And half of what he expected to happen did happen. They stayed on board. The Conservatives won the next election. But of course, the time for the referendum to, came about and it was rolled out. Now, right from the beginning, almost everybody who is an expert has believed that this referendum had no chance of passing, that given a choice between head and heart, between passion and, and doing the right and pocketbook, that, that voters ultimately would decide to stay in the EU because the costs of leaving the EU were considered to be so astronomically high. And of course, in the, in the, in the months leading up to the election, the, the Br Britain broke up into two camps. The Remain camp, which contained most of the status quo, most of the experts, most of the bankers, most of London, pretty much, and the Leave camp, which was, in a sense, everybody else. And what it split the parties. In, in particular, the Conservative Party, you know, David Cameron and his closest, um, closest you know, deputies stayed on the Remain camp. But... Uh, Boris Gove and Ma Michael Gove, um, Boris Johnson and Michael Gove, who were the two biggest conservatives uh, on the Leave camp, would decided to go to the other side, and you could see that the country was split down the middle. And what made the Leave camp a little, dis you know, a little un uncomfortable was the fact that in their camp was Nigel Farage, the leader of of the U UK Independence Party. A party which has been accused of many things, you know, most of them not nice over the last few years. So those are the two camps leading in, and the conventional wisdom, as I said, was that the Remain camp would end up winning the game. Now, of course, on two two weeks ago, on a, on a Thursday night, <coughs> the vo votes started coming in, and to show you how unexpected this was, and I've never seen an event this this surprising to the experts. Until about 8 o'clock that night, people were convinced that, or 10 o'clock at night, until the votes started getting counted, people were convinced that the Remain camp would win. And the votes started rolling in, and at about 2 o'clock in the morning, New York time, I mean, the commentators and the po pollsters finally said, hey, this is it, the Leave camp has won. And that, of course, triggered a whole set of repercussions the next day. In fact, I didn't even wait for the next day. The first casualty in this process was the British pound, which went from 1.5 down to 1.37, just in a sense overnight. And then it's continued to drop since. But on that Friday, right after Brexit, the British pound had lost 8% of its value against the US dollar, about 6% of its value against the euro, and almost 12% of its value against the Japanese yen. That was the first casualty. The next day, of course, we opened to panic panic around the world and the usual responses kicked in. People fled to safety. In this case, that meant buying bonds of governments that were viewed as you know, having safer currencies. So you saw the UST bond rate drop, the euro bond rate drop, the UK government bond rate, which is interesting because in a sense, they were fleeing to safety, but they felt, still felt the British government was still a place of safety and the Japanese yen rate dropped, though when you're negative, how much further can you drop? No, but basically you could see across the world the flight towards safety. No? And you also saw an almost immediate repricing of, you know, oh, incidentally on the flight to safety, the other thing that kicks in in panic is the precious metals go up and gold and silver did go up that Friday. Now, if you go one level further down, 
of course, this was a risk event, and as with all risk events, there was a repricing of risk. And you saw this first in the sovereign CDS spreads. These are, of course, the prices you pay for insuring against default, and you saw this kind of widen the day after Brexit on Friday. But an interesting difference between where the, the spread widened the most, it was mostly in the old EU. These are the, this is the part of the EU, these are the countries that were part of the EU pre-2000. Is the, is the con are the countries where you saw the biggest jump in the CDS spread. You saw a smaller jump in other developed markets. So a jump of about 9% in the U.S. A much smaller jump in the new EU countries. These are the countries that have been admitted into the EU post-2004. Not very much in, in the uh, emerging markets. Already you can see the first effect of Brexit is it's more concentrated in Europe, and particularly in old Europe, with ripples to Britain's main trade partners, the US and Australia, but less of an impact elsewhere in the globe. And if you looked at risk indicators like the VIX or you know the European stock VIX, uh, the VS stocks, which is the European version of the VIX, you saw a jump, but it was not the kind of jump you'd expect to see in a huge crisis. So if you gather the evidence so far, there was an effect on Friday, the day after, which suggested that markets were not seeing this as this global crisis that was going to destroy destroy financial markets globally. And if you looked at the stock market reaction that Friday, you again saw this disparity of reactions. The old EU stock markets were the ones worst affected, down about 17%. You know, the Middle East and, and, and Asia did see a, a bigger impact. So this is in contrast with what you saw in the sovereign CDS spreads. Latin America didn't see much of an impact. As the, and the new EU countries actually saw stock prices go up. So go figure. Again, very wide disparity across the globe in where you saw the damage in stock markets. Now, if you looked across sectors, again, the, I wanted to test the conventional wisdom, which is financial service companies are going to implode. Globally, you didn't see that story play out. I mean, UK banks like Barclays and Royal Bank of Scotland, you did see a big drop in price. But across the globe, you didn't see this meltdown in financial services. Again, good news if you're thinking about 2008 as your rubric for a classic financial crisis. This doesn't look like it. There, when Lehman collapsed, you didn't just see US banks impacted. You saw global banks impacted. You don't see that now. And in fact, when you look across market cap classes, again, in a big crisis, you expect the smallest, you know, the small cap stocks to be devastated because that's where the risk effect hits the most. You didn't see that again in this crisis. So if on Friday, the day after Brexit, you stopped me and asked me about this crisis based on just what I saw that day, it did not look like financial markets were treating this as the kind of crisis, a Lehman type crisis would cause a meltdown around the world. Now, of course, that's a pricing effect, and markets can often be wrong. So as an investor, I have to stop and ask, how does this change my perspective on investing? And to me, the, 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 the tools that make the most sense, the structure that makes the most sense in the midst of a crisis is to look at what drives value. And ultimately, value is driven by three factors, cash flows, growth, and whatever required rate of return you need to discount those cash flows. So the way I frame Brexit is I framed it in terms of those inputs. So I start with cash flows from existing investment and ask, well, how much of an effect will Brexit have on existing earnings as companies have to restructure, reorganize, maybe re... Uh, and and uh, you know, there, there's an adjustment cost, and that cost is obviously going to affect cash flows from existing investments. T to be honest, I think those costs are going to be substantial, but not as a percentage of the the overall cash flows. It's not going to be 50% of the cash flows. So uh, to me, if that were the only impact, I wouldn't be that worried. Could bre Brexit affect growth? Yes, it could. It's definitely going to affect UK real growth, perhaps even growth in the EU. But the, it might it might actually be just shift that growth onto Asia, Latin America. In which case, global growth will not be affected. You might have a reallocation of growth and wealth across the globe, but it's not going to have an overall effect. But there's a story that says if Brexit has these ripple effects through the EU, it could affect global real growth, especially if it creates systemic problems. Systemic problems were primarily in the financial services business that then spill over like they did in 2008 into both real growth and into the price of risk, the equity risk premium. Because there's going to be a short-term impact on the price of risk, but if there's a, it's going to be a long-term impact. It has to come from that systemic risk factor. There's another story, of course, that was being told in the aftermath of Brexit, which is that Brexit is the first of many exits you're going to see out of the EU. And if that does start to happen, the EU might unravel, and the EU unravels. It's a big enough chunk of the global economy that could cause a global 
economic downturn. So the two big systemic factors here are the financial service effect and the EU domino effect, and both of those can have long-term impacts and bigger impact on value. And of course, central banks, as they want, are going to jump in and do their thing, and that's going to have an impact on risk free rate. Looking at the overall picture, will there be a negative effect on value? Yes, but I don't think I don't see the kinds of impact you would need for this for a catastrophic drop in global equity values. Perhaps I'm wrong, and I, clearly I have, I have to keep track of all of these factors. But those, to me, will be the things that determine whether Brexit is going to have a long-term value effect. Now, to me, the most interesting aspect of Brexit was not so much Brexit itself, but what it told us about the rest of the world. And see, here are some things that I think that we can learn out of Brexit that will help us, not just on Brexit, but on other investors. The first is, there's this old notion that markets are counting machines. Markets are not counting machines. They're weighted counting machines. In other words, the people have the most money count the most, and they're biased weighted counting machines. What am I talking about? It's a very interesting graph. It's a graph on the left is actually the polling, basically the probability that that Britain would leave backed out of the betting market. There's actually the markets where people were betting on whether Britain would leave the EU. And in that market, the, the probability that Britain would leave the EU never dropped below 60%. You think, so what? Well, if you look at the polls, the polls actually were mixed, especially in the last few weeks, the last four weeks leading up into the rep into the vote. There was actually, there were several weeks where the leave vote was ahead of the remain vote, but it's almost like the betting markets are ignoring the polls and, bet and, and betting on leave losing in spite of the numbers. And it's not just the betting market. The financial markets in general seem to be underplaying the chance that that Brexit would happen. So that's strange, right? You've got betting markets, those are supposed to be counting machines, and they're counting machines, why weren't they reflecting the numbers? One interesting statistic that came out after Brexit passed, or Britain, you know, or leave side one, was somebody took a look at the betting market and looked to see where the big bets were coming from. And it turned out that all the big bets in, in the betting market were coming on the remain side, and they were coming primarily from London. So you're saying, so what? We talk about bias. And if you're a big London trader and you so want Brexit to fail, that you will bet. In other words, if, you're, if you want something to happen, sometimes you can will yourself into believing it will happen. And all kinds of biases then kick in. You have confirmation bias. So you look only for those polls that support you and ignore those polls that go against you. The facts that are in your favor, the facts against you. I have a feeling that a lot of that happened in this market. Something to keep in mind the next time you see a market price, if you have lots of big bettors and they're all on one side of the action, it's entirely possible that they can cause the price to deviate from the value. Maybe that's what happened at Valiant, with all those value investors all stacked up thinking, telling you that Valiant was the greatest stock on the face of the earth. The second is that, you know, and, and, and I've, I've always been a little leery of, of experts. I don't like being called an expert. But this, I think, Brexit illustrated the emptiness of expertise more than any other event over the last 15 or 20 years. I mean, there are three problems that I think um, afflict expertise re experts right now. The first is what I call the specialist syndrome, which is as uh, as disciplines get you know, deeper and deeper, experts have become specialists. So they know one thing and they know one thing really well, but then very few of them are able to see the big picture. There are a lot of experts in, on Brexit who I think you know, fair, um, were specialists who could not see the big picture. The second reason I think experts have lost their cachet is that when they make mistakes, now the whole world knows. It's not like 10, 20, 30 years ago. When you made mistakes, you could bury them. And only other experts knew and they didn't have any incentive to reveal that you'd screwed up. Now your mistakes are public. And third, we live in a global economy. You're saying, so what? Everybody talks global. We live in an economy where there are so many interlocking pieces that making forecasts, I think, is more, in fact, I'm going to say it's pretty much impossible, especially at a macroeconomic level. So uh, the experts who have these great, li great little models that are structured around controlling the things that go into the model, I think are going to have a serious problem going forward, and the rest of the world has caught on. So for whatever reason, and I mean, I think this reveals that we should, and from an investing standpoint, it means we should be watching CNBC less, listening to those professionals even even less than we used to, because I think 
if they didn't know much before and they screwed up before, they know even less now and they screw up even more. Third, one of the pet, one of my pet, you know, one of my pet topics in valuation for the last couple of years has been how that, that to do valuation right, you got to connect stories to numbers. And the Brexit debate, I think this kind of played out. The Leave side might not have had any much facts, but they had a compelling story. A story that you and I might not have found appealing, a story of a return to an old time Britain which controlled its own destiny. It was very appealing to people who are 50, 60, 70 years old, especially if they remembered that Britain in, in sepia tones. The Remain side was almost all about telling you why the Leave side's narrative was not you know, plausible or probable and giving you numbers. And when stories fight numbers, the narrative almost always wins. In the Brexit debate, you saw it play out. Something to remember the next time you think about investing. It is investing based on stories as much stronger staying power than we, than we realize, even in the face of numbers that might seem like they should lead you to leave the story. And finally, this I think more than anything, the Brexit brought home the governance issue. Of course, it's political governance where voters decided their fate, which is what you're supposed to do in a democracy. I see the parallels to corporate democracy because post Brexit, what are you hearing from people, especially those people who lost? They say, well, this is why we can't trust people to make big decisions because they'll make the wrong one. If that sounds familiar, it's a debate we've been hearing in the corporate governance you know, argument for the last. 20 or 30 years. On the one side are those people who argue that corporations are owned by shareholders and shareholder democracy means that you have to listen to shareholders, that they should vote on outcomes. On the other side are those people who say, hey, look, you know what? You can't trust these shareholders to make the right judgments. We should be making it for them. So that's why you get the tilting of voting rights, the changing of the rules, so the incumbents essentially control the system. I think there are a lot of people who look at Brexit and say this is why shareholders should not be allowed to make big decisions. I disagree with them because I'm a Democrat at heart, you know, a corporate Democrat, and I think shareholders should be allowed to make their decisions. But this to me has parallels with the political governance argument you're hearing out there. Let's face it though, if you tell me you believe in democracy, then you have to live with the consequences, which means sometimes you're going to lose. In fact, no, I wouldn't be surprised if you lose about half the time. If every time you lose, you threaten to take your pieces and go home or move to Canada or move to, I don't know, to Switzerland, you're not behaving like a grown-up. And a lot of those people who've lost the Brexit debate seem to be intent on showing how stupid the people who voted for Brexit are rather than asking why did you no know, why did they you know why did that why did the leave side win and, and and i think those those arguments are going to echo you know when you when you look at corporate governance fights that are going to come over the next 10 to 20 years so what's the end game i think that as a crisis this is a crisis but i'm not you know i i didn't act right after the crisis in fact i've done very little to my portfolio since Brexit. Part of the reason is Brexit does the adjustment for me, right? Whether I like it or not. So my British stocks are worth less. Why they're worth less? If the pound is down 10, 11 percent, my portfolio. So my portfolio already adjusts for the new world order. If I try to adjust more, I might be overcompensating. Of course, there are people who say, why don't you do Now it's time to be a contrarian. Well, being a knee-jerk contrarian has never worked for me. Just because markets are down doesn't mean that they're a bargain. So I will go bottom, I'll go bottom fishing, but it'll be very selective. I'm looking for companies that I think have been unfairly dragged to the bottom, perhaps British companies that get 80% of their revenues in the U.S. And finally, to me, I, you know, the canaries in the coal mine here, things that will indicate to me that Brexit is going to spill over into a much larger systemic problem are going to be the financial service companies. If you see financial service companies start to take on water in terms of have capital problems, then I think we have a real issue of this starting to spread into the rest of the economy. So I'm going to keep my eyes on, on, on those developments. But for the moment, Brexit's happened. I've got to learn to live with it and move on. Thank you very much for listening.